Email from dad was never verbose. This one arrived addressed to my brother and me in February 2021. It said, I got all the paperwork signed and ready to perform the act on May 10th. If you're going to attend, you can make travel plans accordingly. Dad. That May 10th would be to my dad's 92nd birthday. Through his 30 years of retirement, dad was a voracious reader of spy fiction, history, and the origins of life. He was a lover of all animals, holding most of them in higher esteem than his own species. He volunteered in the local seabird rescue group. He started the catch, neuter, and release program to address the rampant Morro Bay feral cat population, the graduates of which he continued to feed regularly at various locations around town until their population dwindled a few years later. Age began dragging his body down, though. His increasingly poor hearing, bypass surgery, disqualified him for his pilot's license renewal, so he sold the biplane that he had built and certified from a kit. After a lifelong love affair with motorcycles, he sold the BMW too. One year, once a year, he would spring for a fishing trip for my older brother and me to join him in the Sierras. Dad, of course, was a pro, and Chip and me, uh, Chip was pretty good at it. I still suck at it. But by 2018, his diminished mobility and stamina limited his participation to just him going along for the camaraderie and watching Chip and I fish and drink. By 2020, his best friend had died as had most of his old colle colleagues and friends that he kept in touch with via email. His heart problems had gotten worse and the drugs had gotten much stronger until it was just him and mom stuck in the house, their old cat, Sulpy, their daily routine centered around going to the grocery, pharmacy, doctor's appointments, on their weekly date night to the Harbor Hut. <laughs> Violating COVID protocol, Chip and I visited them for Thanksgiving in 2020. It was then that dad dolefully admitted that he couldn't read anymore. The low dosages of his prescribed opioid clouded his head and he couldn't focus. He would end up dozing on and off all day in his recliner tethered to his oxygen concentrator. And that's when I knew he was done. He was ready to go. So in February, when he wrote that email to tell us that he had all the approvals for medical assisted suicide, it was not a surprise. His fear was being hospitalized, unable to die, trapped in a useless body, a burden emotionally and financially to everyone. He needed to leave on his own terms. I told him I understood and respected his decision. I thanked him for all that he had done for me over the years, that he was a good man and a terrific dad, and that I recognized his good and even some of his bad qualities in myself and my sons. His commitment to family and friends, a love of discovery, his discretion and honesty, his humor, and his temper. I told him I thought he had an impressive life and he had won the game. And he said thank you and made it clear he only wanted me and Chip there with my mom for the big send-off day. Dad was a planner. Every day he had a list of chores to do, errands to run, endless stream of hobbies that he managed from his desk and a PC that still ran Windows XP. Chip and I had been getting updated wills and codicil codicils for, uh, annually for 10 years. Financial accounts, passwords, directives, people to call, <laughs> services to cancel, all laid out in an enumerated checklist. And even though he planned to be cremated, he had purchased a small headstone for himself. It sat in the garage for the last couple of years, <laughs> all carved and ready to go except for the death date, which of course was filled out in March when he took it over to the local mortuary to have him finish it. He did say that the interaction with the mortician was a bit awkward. <laughs> I drove up to Morro Bay Thursday before the scheduled Monday birthday send off, picking up my brother at the airport. We nervously assured each other that this was classic dad and that we were ready to deal with it and with mom. We let ourselves into the house like it was just another visit. Hugs, laughter, a barrage of questions about the flight and L.A. traffic, how's the family, the dogs, the grandkids. And as always, Dad made sure that when we arrived, there was a new half gallon of beef eaters for me and kettle one for Chip, sitting prominently on the living room bar next to the same bottle of vermouth we had been working on since 2011. <laughs> Cocktail hour was always at 5 p.m. sharp, cuckooed and Winchester chimed in by the four loud clocks placed around the house. Dad lamented that he couldn't drink anymore, 
but he could never resist joining and nursing a single shot of wild turkey while we were all together. Mom never had a loss her words, talked nonstop the entire day Friday <laughs> about everything and nothing. <laughs> Dad interrupting only occasionally went awake to add fragments of color commentary, but nothing was said about what was going to happen on Monday. Even though Dad had the mixing bottle and the packets of chemicals to be used for the procedure along with the annotated copy of the instructions all neatly arranged on the end table next to his chair. On Saturday morning after breakfast, Chip finally punched the elephant in the room and asked Dad what, how it was all going to go down on Monday. 9 a.m. kickoff time. I should be done by noon. <laughs> his innate adherence to structure and schedule was unscathed beneath his shrunken body and loud whisper voice, and he still brandished the smirk. I asked him what the pr process was, and he pointed me towards the printed instructions. I discovered that it was a three-part procedure. It takes about two hours. And per state law, no one could assist him. He had to do every single step himself. Clearly, state law probably didn't realize that dad would have had it no other way. <laughs> so 9 a.m. it was. This even worked for mom, who insisted that she would need time to get dressed and put on her makeup. It struck me a little odd at first before I realized that this would likely be the single most significant day of her life. Okay, we had a plan. A plan and two days to kill first. The four of us sitting in this living room. This is when I got the idea for the full life review. I went down to the garage and hauled up the steamer trunk of old photos. Photos from their entire lives mixed with the photos that they inherited from the family collections from their parents. Focusing on dad's side, I dug down deep and back in time, pulling up old sepia prints and faded black and whites. Dad was born in Olympia, Washington. Spent the first four years of his life in a logging camp with his father as part of the crew and his mother one of the cooks. The depression moved them back to Susanville, California where their families were. And dad's father went off to fight World War II and fell in love with a nurse on the way back and never returned. So dad finished growing up on his grandparents' ranch influenced by the mechanical ingenuity of his grandfather. He excelled in school, got into the Naval Academy earning a degree in electrical engineering. And he met my mom on a blind date, graduated in 1952. They got married the next day, and a week later, he was on a ship patrolling the coast of Korea. He got out of the Navy, finished grad school at Berkeley, and then finally burned out on the Southern California Cold War defense contractor rat race in the early 60s. So he finished his PhD, packed up the family, and moved us to Vermont and became an academic professor and eventually chairman of the physics department at the University of Vermont, specializing in, specializing in electro optics and quantum mechanics. He retired and moved back to California in the early 90s. We spent a day dredging up old stories, his life on the ranch, his academy roommate who set him up on that first date with mom, their year of courting through letters and telegrams, meeting her folks, and that faux pas where he showed up late and drunk on Christmas Eve. He perked up telling the stories, but mostly with his eyes closed, as if he was revisualizing them in his head. Some stories I had heard before, but this time with a lot more detail and warmth. Mom sat by, adding on her often rambling sidebars, which occasionally spooled into a minor debate between the two about insignificant facts. <laughs> there was a lot of laughter, occasional tears. This consumed the entire day, up to and through cocktail hour. And then we all loaded into their Buick and went to the Harbor Hut for dinner. Dad had a cup of clam chowder. He said he didn't feel like eating. He said he was shutting down. Sunday was Mother's Day. And as always, Dad insisted that the whole deep day be focused on her. Nothing about him today. Back in February, I joked with Dad that he chose to die exactly on the completion of his 92nd so solar orbit because quantum physicists are obsessed with integer numbers a theory which I think still has some validity. But it came, I came to realize that he chose that date so that we'd all be together for mom on Mother's Day, and it would provide some respite in the midst of our death knell weekend. We took mom to a champagne brunch at Cayucas. Dad had a juice and a fruit cup. Back home and reinstalled into our living room, I soon returned to the boxes of pictures, but this time getting mom to tell her stories 
reliving all the adventures she had with dad over their 70 years together. She was raised in a straight-laced Catholic home in Norfolk, Virginia, before meeting my dyed-in-the-wool atheist and conservatively hedonistic dad. She told us about the dozen or so moves and then are, are finally moving to my childhood home in the back roads of Vermont. She recalled all their sabbatical years in Norway and Russia, Romania, and talked about touring Europe on, on much, and much of the US on the back of a motorcycle and later in an RV towing a motorcycle. I've had a great life, she kept saying, and none of it would have happened if I hadn't met your father. Mom was strong and in good spirits. It was clear that she had been pre preparing and processing her remaining life without dad during the last three months of pre-mourning. And she was also an expert in emotional compartmentalization. I know this because that's where I get it from. <laughs> I came upstairs around 8 a.m. on Monday morning and dad was already in his chair mixing his hemlock concoctions per the instructions. He was one of those dads who packed the car for vacation the night before and then fumed if we weren't on the road by 7.30 sharp. So there's no reason to expect that he would not be raring to go today. So by 8.30, we were all gathered in the living room, coffee and muffins and makeup on, ready to proceed with the hastily revised kickoff time. The first ghost, g dose he guzzled down was a chalky white six ounces to prevent nausea and vomiting from the drugs that would follow. After taking this one, he had to wait 30 minutes. At this point, my mom pulled out the full three pages of instructions and began rereading the preparation section on page one, which dad had conveniently glossed over to get to the nitty gritty. It says here, you should be lying on a bed and not in a chair, she said. Nope, I'm going out in my chair. This is where I wanna be. We didn't argue, it was clearly his call. <laughs> Mom said that in that case he needed to get up for a minute and she shooed him over to the couch and started covering the chair with an old blanket and sheet that she had retrieved from the back room. Apparently this was a pro tip she had gleaned from the what to expect bullets in the preparation section. <laughs> What's that for, he muttered. Skirting the biological realities, I went straight for humor. I said, dad, it's your burial shroud. Try to leave a good image. And he chuckled. All of my adult life, my relationship with my dad has been centered around me trying to make him laugh and the, our dark and nerdy sense of humor that we shared. It felt really good to score one last time. No one else laughed though. Mom huffed a sigh of distaste and Chip, Chip really wasn't dealing with any of this very well. He sat in the chair across the room looking on with concern, not saying much. He was kind of put off by the weirdness of it all, and it was weird, I grant him that. Dad sat back down in his neatly diapered chair, and soon it was time for dose number two, which is a very strong sedative and painkiller. After drinking the sedative, you are again instructed to wait about 30 minutes before drinking the third dose, that is the drug that stops your heart, and which would be incredibly painful without the sedative. So now it was Dad's turn to talk. He spoke like he was giving a toast, and in true form, he kept it brief. He said that he'd done all the things he dreamed of doing in life, and it was a full life. And he and Mom took each other's hands and began talking. Mom threw tears, but she hung in there. Chip nodded to me, and we both went in the kitchen for more coffee and to give them some space. <clears throat> When we came back out, he stood up. He thanked Chip and I for being here for this and, assured, and we assured him that we would take care of mom so he wouldn't have to come back and haunt us. <laughs> he gave me a long hug and told me to enjoy life and do what makes me happy. He said he was proud of me and I said I loved him. And then we said goodbye. He shuffled over and had a similar exchange with Chip. And then finally, he embraced my mom who was by now a blubbering mess but he held her tight and whispered to her long enough to calm her down. He picked up cup number three and chugged it like a pro, wincing audibly at the taste before washing it down with a little pineapple juice. He sat back down in his chair and pushed himself back in his recliner. The sedative was fully engaged and made him sleepy, but we kept talking to him. Eventually he stopped replying and then stopped acknowledging altogether. 
After a few minutes, he was asleep, looking no different than he had the previous couple of days. The three of us sat there not saying much. We mostly just mulled around in our own thoughts and curious about what was going to happen next. After about 10 minutes or so, Mom stood up and touched his throat to check his pulse. That's when he opened his eyes and said, almost annoyed, I'm still here and I don't know why. <laughs> we all gasped. He squirmed a bit and got comfortable and then drifted back off. Those were my dad's final words. <laughs> Poetic and absolutely in character. <laughs> After a few minutes, his unconscious body began trembling intensely, which went on for quite a while. I leaned over and I held his left calf to steady his shaking leg. Soon he transitioned to stillness and light, raspy breathing. Then that slowly wound down too. After about 15 minutes of checking, we couldn't feel the pulse, and he was gone. Mom pushed his mouth closed and kissed him on the forehead. We called the woman from hospice, per the instructions. For liability reasons, they are not allowed to be present until after he's gone. So the three of us sat around the living room talking to each other with dead dad in the chair, waiting for the doorbell to ring. <laughs> Mom went into the kitchen and asked if we wanted something to eat, and Chip started texting home. We had achieved peak weird. The old cat Sophie came in and sniffed dad's leg for about a minute, meowing occasionally. Then instead of hopping up into his lap, as she always did, she just turned around and went back downstairs to her spot in his office. The woman from hospice finally arrived and mom let her in. I think she thought it was a bit macabre that Chip and I were just sitting there by now poking at our iPads with dad's corpse peacefully reclined in the chair. The woman confirmed no pulse and began filling out the death certificate and asked a list of succinct questions with well-rehearsed sympathy. We agreed on 11, 10 a.m. as his time of death, not realizing until later that dad would have really liked a real sharp 1,100 hours. <laughs> then the woman said, I'm going to need you two to carry him to the bedroom where I can prep him for pickup. Chip looked stunned. Mom piled on with, I, and I told you so, but I just smiled because I immediately realized that dad knew that this would happen and he would think that this was hilarious. <laughs> Chip grabbed him under the arms and I grabbed his feet and we awkwardly carried him down the hall and plopped him on the bed like a drunken, passed out sailor, a role I am absolutely certain he never played. I drove home a couple days later, a few things in a box in the seat next to me, some old photos, a couple of his annotated textbooks, a few mementos from his office that had been around my entire life. For years, I, uh, for years when I drove away from their house, I always had this uneasy thought that this might be the last time that I would see him, or even my mom, although she will likely outlive us all. <laughs> but on this departure, that uneasy feeling was replaced with one of relief, a shared closure for the three of us, and his was a good death for a good life, the one he wanted. Cheers, Dad. Eber Lambert, ladies and gentlemen, Ebert.